Okay, Tov, Baruch Haba, welcome, good evening, Shalom. Uh, this is our beginner's class, and uh, tonight we're studying the letter Chet, and uh, we'll get into, we'll introduce the letter Tet, uh, the eighth and ninth letter of the alphabet. We have our new letter of, which is the letter Yud, which is this one here, it looks like an apostrophe, um, and its number is Tet. Um, it, it signifies a hand. We'll get into all of that as we get there. Let's go through the alphabet a couple of times here. Aleph, Ben, Gimel, Dalet, Ten, Vav, Zayin, Chet, Tet, Yud. Aleph, Ben, Gimel, Dalet, Ten, Vav, Zayin, Chet, Tet, Yud. Alev, Ben, Gemo, Dalet, He, Va, Zayin, Chet, Ten, Yud. All right, numbers. And Yud, Ten, that's the last of the, uh, what do you call it? The, the single digit, uh, this will be the last of the single digit, and from here, you start going by tens, okay? So, all here was by single digits, now you're going to start going by tens. In other words, <coughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now this one will be 20, 30, 40. Okay? So, ready? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Again? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. One more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. So we're talking about the letter Chet. And we spoke last week, first of all, uh, the sound of the letter Chet is a K-H sound. Uh, the letter He. But you notice that it is closed. You have the letter He here, and then here's Chet. And so they're related. The He is open, so it's the, the soft breath sound. And then you have the Chet. Now, we spell it C-H, but it is Chet. Okay? Um, the reason why it's spelled with a C-H is because over here you have a cough. Over here, you had a hoof, and they all have those same similar sounds. Okay, so here you'll get into a K. This is a hard K, and then you take the uh, you take the dot out right here, the dagesh. You take that out, and it becomes the softer K, the same as the chet sound. Uh, this is a hoof. Uh, it is also the hard K sound, but to distinguish it, uh, oftentimes it will be translated with Q. So that when you're transliterating, when you come to this, you'll see this as a CH, you'll see this as a K or a KH, and you'll see this as a Q. There is no softening of this sound here. So uh, uh, whether Dagesh or Dagesh or whatever, there's, there's no softening. This is just the, the, the K sound, the K sound. Uh, but to distinguish it in a transliteration, oftentimes it will take a Q. Uh, this one will oftentimes take a K or a KH. This one usually is CH. This one never hardens. It's always the, the softer K sound from the back of the throat, the uh, uh, like you're trying to clear your throat. So the KH sound. So Chet. This, the, the paleo. This is a fence. This is a fence. And its number is eight. Its number is eight. Now, what is significant about the number eight Remember we dealt with 
this number and we dealt with this number, okay? This was the Zayn and this was the Vav. Okay, so we dealt with these two numbers, six. Six is less than seven. So what can we say about seven? Seven is less than eight. Eight is greater than seven. Okay, so eight is more than seven. So we said that seven is the number of perfection or completion. Then six is imperfect, it is the number of man. Imperfect. All right. So this perfection, this is completion to be complete. I said there are seven days in a week. It's a complete week. Six would just take us to Friday. That's an incomplete week. We're one short. Eight is more than seven. Eight is more than seven. And so we're going to talk about that because that's that's important as well. The number eight. Um, why is the number eight important? The number eight is important because Chet is the letter for Chai. Which means alive. It is the letter of of Chen. which is grace. Which is mercy, usually translated as kindness. If I said chasid, if I put those on there, chasid, this is the practice. So, who is a chassid? You've heard of chassidic Jews. Buenas noches. <laughs> so, you've heard of 
a Hasid, you heard of the Hasidic Jews. What is a Hasidic Jew? Basically, these are Jews who practice kindness. These are people of kindness, or of mercy. Usually when you're speaking of a Hasid, of a Hasidic Jew, you're speaking of, you're speaking about an ultra-Orthodox sect. These are the Hasidim. And if you get into any uh, Messianic Jewish sites or on Facebook or whatever, you will often see, you'll, you'll see that Yeshua is put into two categories. Yeshua is usually put into two categories. The first being of the Prushim. Prushim is the Hebrew way of saying Pharisees. And you will see him mentioned as a Hasid. As a Hasid. Because he demonstrates many character traits of the Hasidim, of today's Hasidim. Uh, much of what he, what, much of what he taught, uh, we would say today, is very Hasidic uh, about loving and forgiving and kindness and all of these kinds of things. So it's very Hasidic. So question here, Prushim. I said that you will see many categorizing him, and by the way, not just in not just in Messianicism, but you'll see many in Judaism. In normative Judaism, characterizing Yeshua as a Pharisee, as a Prushi. Okay? Parush. Uh, so the Prushi, the Pharisees. And because and this is this is a uh, curious, strange to people in church and in Christianity, because much of church and Christianity teaches that the Pharisees were enemies of Yeshua. That he did not like them. That they were always arguing. And that's not exactly correct. What is correct is actually most of his followers were Pharisees or Prushi. And Rab Shalom, the Apostle Paul himself, never stopped being a Pushi. He never stopped being a Pharisee. He was always a Pharisee. And in fact, when he's giving his, when he's giving his testimony, I believe it was uh, in 1 Corinthians or somewhere there, but he says that he is, he does not say, I was a Pharisee. He says, I am a Pharisee. He says, I am a Pharisee of Pharisees. Uh, so he's speaking in present tense. You would think that if they were the enemies, that uh, he would have he would have given up his <laughs> My grandson. Yeah. The smallest one. <laughs> How many? I have five. All right, so Yeshua's, Yeshua's argument was not against all Pharisees, against all Pushi. It was only against certain ones, and he tells us which ones he was against. Who did he argue with? Who was it who he went against? He went against those who were hypocritical. Not obviously today, the term Pharisee in Christianity is used as a pejorative, as a put-down. So in church today, if the pastor calls you a Pharisee, that's not a good thing. In Judaism, if you're called a Pharisee, that's considered to be an excellent thing, even to this day. In fact, what we know as rabbinic Judaism, Judaism, that is overseen by the rabbis, rabbinic Judaism, which is most of Judaism today. Rabbinic Judaism is the are the 
Um, the children is the child of of Pharisee, of the Pharisaical of Pharisaical Judaism. In fact, it is for the most part, it is the only Judaism that exists today. It's the only Judaism that is left. All other branches of Judaism, with the exception basically of Messianic Judaism, all other branches of Judaism died off. So there are, are no Sadducees today. There are no, the, uh, the, uh, the term Sadducee, that's another term I'll give you, is, uh, is actually Tzadokim. Tzadikim. Tzadik meaning righteous. And it's from that that we get the word Sadducee. You can see the relationship here. Just as you can see the relationship here. Okay. By the way, the Pharisees were also these. Pharisees were also Hasidic Jews. For the most part. Okay. So um, you had you had these that he was again, you had these. What I was saying, these are no longer in existence today. There are no Sadducees today. These are still in existence today. Who are they? All of Judaism today. All of rabbinic Judaism today. Are the result of the Pharisaical movement. So, when we see, uh, when we see the Pharisees being put down in Christianity and in the church today, that is an incorrect perspective. Whom he was speaking against were hypocrites. He himself was followed many Pharisaic teachings, many of the teachings of the Pushim. And in fact, we I think what I've shared this with you before. Um, Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, his teacher was Gamliel. Gamliel was the head of the Prushim. He was the head, if you would consider like today's, uh, today's uh, uh, political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, the more conservative side would have, uh, uh, well, I'll put it to you this way. Okay, so it would be like whoever's the head, uh, Donald Trump, the president, he's the head of the Republican Party, so long as he's president. Uh, whoever is the head, I don't know who's the head of the Democratic Party right now. Uh, president Obama was when he was in office. Uh, so whoever's in, in, in office as the president is the head of that party. So Gabriel was the head of the Prushik. He was the head of that party, of that political party. By the way, in Israel, the majority of the parties, of the political parties in Israel, are religious. They are actually religious parties. Because in Israel, you do not separate your religion and your politics. Your religion will tell you what your politics is, and your politics will tell you what your religion is. I.e., what branch you come from, what, what uh, section you come from of Judaism. So you have ultra, you have orthodox, you have ultra orthodox, you have conservative, you have uh, modern, modern orthodox, you have uh, um, reconstruction, uh, reconstruction orthodox, uh, reconstruction Judaism, um, and you have uh, reform Judaism. Okay, these are the basic, and then you have people who are. Uh, uh, don't know if there's a God there, what's the term? You have atheists and then you have, um, I want to say antagonists, but that's not the right word. <laughs> so, so anyway, yes. So, um, anyway, so you have, you have those kinds of parties as well. So you have a hundred parties in Israel, a hundred political parties, because you have all of these parties are coming from different backgrounds. Uh, the Labour Party is more of uh, the old European socialist style. Uh, the Likud is probably more in order of what 
the American Democratic Party would be uh, today. They're seen as they're called the conservatives, but their conservative, uh, their conservative is relative. Their conservatism is relative. They would probably be more like the more like the Democratic Party today. And then left of the Democrat of the Democratic Party are the socialists, and so uh, Likud would be like our Democratic Party, and then la uh, the Labor Party would be the socialist, more of the socialist type of party. So anyway, but it all has to do with religion. It's all tied in with, with religion. And so uh, the same is true in Yeshua's day. These were religious parties, but they were also political parties. The head of the, the head of the Prushim was Gamliel. Gamliel is, is Rav Shaul's rabbi. Okay? He's Rav Shaul's rabbi. He's his teacher. And so Rav, Rav Shaul says that he sat at the feet of Gamliel. What does that mean? To sit at the feet, to sit at the feet of the rabbi. Does anybody know what that means? Right here. To sit at the feet of the rabbi. Right here. The closer you were to the rabbi, the closer you were to the rabbi. Say that you remember you remember Yohanan, you remember John. The Last Supper. Where is John sitting? Where is John sitting? Come on. Next to Christ. Right next to him. Why? He's in the favored position. The closer you are to your rabbi, the closer you are to your rabbi. Say, the closer seat, the closer your seat is to the rabbi, the closer in, in, in heart, in fellowship, whatever, uh, in, in fellowship you are to the rabbi. So we call John what? John is known by the name as John the Beloved. We're going to go stay over there. Okay. <laughs> well, you notice in most churches, where, do every, where, where does everybody choose to sit? Why does everybody choose to sit in the back? It actually does say something. It actually does say something. Now, when we choose to sit in the back, we will be close to the door. It's an escape clause. Okay? Uh, so, so everybody tries to pile into the back because we don't want to be so close to the teacher, the preacher, for whatever reason, whatever reason. Well, in, in Judaism, the closer you are, in fact, even today in Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox Judaism, um, Chabad, uh, and, and such as this, um, the closer, you, ha you have to buy your seat in the synagogue. You have to buy your seat in the synagogue. Okay? So, um, it's not like church where you can just walk in and sit anywhere, whatever. There are seats in the synagogue, and they're sold. The spaces in the synagogue are sold. So, and this is the way the synagogue raises money. This is the way, one of the ways that they pay their bills and things like that. Uh, basically, you buy your seat by paying your dues. Okay? So, uh, kind of like the country club, if you're going to belong to a country club or the, uh, the exercise gym or whatever, you're going to belong to one of these things, what do you do? You have to pay your monthly dues or your annual dues. You pay your fee. So the same thing is true in synagogues. So if you're, if you're going to be a member of a synagogue, you have to pay your dues. And then monthly or uh, bi-monthly or uh, every six months or every year, whatever. In many Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox synagogues, the closer the seat is to where the rabbi stands to teach, the more expensive the seat becomes. The more expensive the seat becomes. So that the, the seats on the front row are premium. It's kind of like going to the theater, right? When you go to the theater, the closer you are to the stage, the higher you pay. Football stadium, if you go to a football game, you can, you can buy the cheap 
way up high, nosebleed section, or you could buy the very expensive front row seats, right behind the players or whatever. The same is true in the synagogue. Why? Why is it that way? Because these people love their rabbis and they want to be close to them. They want to be close to their teaching, to the teacher, to their teaching. They love their rabbi. The, the, the perspective of, of the, of the uh, Orthodox Jew and the rabbi is much different than our perspective of a pastor of a teacher, of a religious leader. And they want to be close to you. Now, understand that this is not, this is not a strange or quaint thing in Judaism. This goes all the way back to the days of Yeshua. What happens when he goes, when he starts to preach, what happens? The people crush him. They gather in close to him. They want to be near him. They want to touch him. Okay, why? They love him. He's a holy man. He's a tzaddik. He's a righteous man. And and so they press him so close that many times he he has to back out of the crowd. It gets too much for him. One time he even does what? He has to step inside one of the uh, one of the tzaddik boats, right? And they have to push him off to shore a little bit so there can be some space between him and the people. So when I say that Rav Shaul sat at the feet of Gabriel, being close to your rabbi means being close to your rabbi. That he was sitting right here at the rabbi's feet means that he was very close to the rabbi's heart. John sitting right there next to Yeshua meant that he was very near, very close to, to Yeshua's heart. And so he describes himself as the one whom Yeshua loved. Gabriel is the grandson of Hillel. Hillel, to this day, is one of the most famous Jewish rabbis of all time. Hillel was the founder of the Prushim, of the Pharisees. Meaning what? He was the founder of the Prushim, who became the rabbinic, became rabbinic Judaism of today. So. The rabbinic Judaism of today can trace itself all the way back to Hillel. Hillel, Gamaliel, Paul, Shaul. Okay? They're all Pharisees. They're all Prushim. Nachdimon Nicodemus was also the head of the Prushim. So, In saying that, the, the idea is always explaining that why people say, why you will hear people saying that Yeshua was a Pharisee, that he was a Hasid. This is why. Because the truth is he actually agreed with them more than he disagreed with them. The ones he really disagreed with were these. He disagreed with the Sadducees in everything. There were two parties. There were two parties in uh, in, Pharis, in, in, in the Pharisees among the Pharisees, the first uh, uh, Pushim. And the two parties were named after their. The first was Hillel, and the second was. Was was Shema. Okay, these were the two Pharisee parties. Yeshua agreed with Hillel ninety nine percent of the time. So in all of his rulings. He almost always agreed with Hillel. Almost always. He agreed with the party of Hillel. 
He agreed with Shammai. There's only one time when we can find where Yeshua agrees with the party of Shammai. And the distinction was Hillel. Shammai taught the letter of the law. Hillel taught the heart or the spirit. Meaning what? So with Shammai, when it said eye for eye, tooth for tooth, Shammai said, yeah, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You put out somebody's eye, they'll put your eye out. You knock out somebody's tooth, we're going to knock out your tooth. Why? Well, because that's exactly what Torah said. Hillel said, no, that's not what it means. Hillel said, you put out somebody's eye, we will put a price on that eye, and you will pay restitution. We're not going to put out your eye because you put out somebody else's eye. That's the spirit of the law. You put out somebody's tooth, we're not going to put out your tooth. We're going to put a price on that tooth, and we're going to charge you restitution for that tooth. By the way, today's uh, American justice system does exactly this, does it not? You pay restitution, they sue you, you go to court, the court determines the, the price of, of your flesh, your pound of flesh, whatever it is, the court determines what that is, and then you pay restitution. So, that kind of thing. The only time when Yeshua agrees with Shammai, with the house of Shammai, is with divorce. He's very strict about divorce. But that is the only place where he agrees with the house of Shammai. One time. So, having said all of that, to say that we were going over Chai Chen Chesed. Chai, to be alive. Chet, grace. Chesed, mercy or kindness. All of these come from Chet. All of these have to do with the number eight. Why? Well, because we started here. We moved to here and we moved to here. This is more than this. This is one more. One above. A step up. Why? Because understand that none of this, understand that none of this is necessary or required. God does not have to bring you to life. He does not have to give you a new life. God does not have to show you grace. God does not have to show you mercy. These things are all extra. What do we mean extra? Ready on place for it. How many of you have heard this term? It's the icing on the cake. Say what? What does this mean? It's the icing on the cake. Somebody, you, somebody, you do something for somebody, whatever, and they tell you that was the icing on the cake. What do they say to you? Huh? Okay. The cake was enough. The cake was good. The cake was enough. What? That made it even better. That makes it even better. Uh, another another expression like that is that maybe your maybe your love has told you this from some some time that you are the. Have you ever have you ever heard that expression? It's like the cherry on top. 
Meaning what? You have a bowl of ice cream, right? <laughs> it's above and beyond. You have the you have the bowl of ice cream, and then you put all the whipped cream and the nuts and the chocolate and whatever, and you stick that cherry on the top, and boom, you got it. A Sunday or whatever. <laughs> okay. So, was the cherry necessary to make the ice cream good, or was the ice cream already good? Was it good? Was it good enough just the way it was? The truth is, was ice cream good enough the way it was? If you were like me, um, all of my life, until I came down with, with uh, the diabetes, all of my life, I was a lover, a consumer of ice cream. I loved Blue Bell ice cream. I loved it. I would buy the half gallon, I could sit there, I could actually, I don't know, maybe it's how I got my diabetes, I could actually sit there and eat a half, a, a, you know, a, a, a quart by myself. And I would get very upset if the boys, growing up, the boys got into the freezer and got into my ice cream. <laughs> I would buy them ice cream, more like the H-E-B brand or whatever, and I would buy my ice cream, which was the blue, the, the, the what is it? What's it? Bluebell. Bluebell. Okay. So the ice cream was enough. It's good enough as it is. So when you put the cherry on top, that just makes it extra, extra special. That God created us is sufficient, but then that He goes out of His way to do this, to show His grace, to show His kindness, to do all of these things, and especially since we do so much that is wrong, and yet He still shows us kindness. He goes out of His way. This is the cherry on top. In, in Judaism, we have a term, in Hebrew, we have a term that we say during Pesach, during Passover. We have Passover coming in about a month and a half or so, a couple of months. We have Passover coming, and if you'll join us, we'll be able, we'll, we'll do this. You'll see this in action. But we have a thing called Dayenu. Everyone say Dayenu. Dayenu comes from Dai. 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 Everyone say Dai. As in El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Shaddai. El Shaddai means God is sufficient. So Dai has the idea of sufficiency. Huh? It would have been enough. Yeah, it would have been. So that's what Dayenu means. It would have been sufficient. It would have been enough. So we go through a litany on Pesach. We go through a litany in which we read a statement. A statement is read and the, and the people at the Seder, the congregation, if you would, all yell out, Dayenu. Everyone say, Dayenu. And so basically what it is, is uh, it goes step by step through the story of the Passover. That if all God had done was this, if all God had done was rescued us from Egypt, everyone says, Dayenu, that would have been enough. If all God had done uh, was fed us manna from heaven, Dayenu. If all God had done was crossed us over the Red Sea, Dayenu. If all God had done uh, was to give us water, Dayenu. If all God had done was to do this and all the way through. So they go through all of the story of the wilderness and every time we yell out, Dayenu, it would have been enough. Say what? If all God had done for you and me, if all God had done for us was to give us life, that would have been enough. If all God had done was to save you, that should be enough. But did God just, did He only save you? Or has he done more for you? 
Come on, has God only saved you or has He done more? He's done more. How much more? He answers your prayer. He supplies your needs. He does all of these things. And after all of these things, we can say, Dayenu, Dayenu, Dayenu. Then we finally can say this, that what? He has given to us uh, uh, eternal life. He's given to us eternal life. Where? That He gives us eternal life. Dayenu. That he gives us eternal life in his city, in his in his uh, uh, house, Dayen. That we're going to walk the street of gold, Dayen. That we're all of these things that are described for us in, by the book of Revelation, by Yohanan, John, Dayen, Dayen, Dayen. But that we will be able to cast our crown at the feet of Yeshua and live in his love forever and ever, Dayen. It, all of this, if He had only saved us, that would have been enough. But look at how much more He pours on top. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. You understand what we're saying here? That's what this is all about. Grace and kindness, mercy. God did not have to, He does not have to show us these things. He does this by His own choice and His own free will. Can anybody force you to be kind to somebody else? Can anybody force you to be kind to somebody else? Well, the parent can force the kid, but he's not truly being kind. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, right? Because that's what mom would do with us. We get into arguments. There were ten kids in our family. Eight boys and two girls. We were a big family. Eight boys, two girls. With eight boys, Every week, you know, a fist fight is going to break out. Literally, a fist fight. We would have our standoff moments. And mom would come in very agitated for some reason. Stand between the two fighters and just give them what for verbally. And mom's eyes, mom had, mom has steel gray eyes that turned to ice like that. She could kill with stairs, literally. You could see the knives coming out. She had steel gray eyes. And she would say, now, apologize to your brother. I can tell you that none of us wanted to apologize. Shake hands. We don't want to shake hands. <clears throat> but we could not stare. Two things. We could not, we could not stand my mother's stare. Number two, we did not want to break her heart. Mm -hmm. So we would apologize. But it did not merit as a mitzvah. Why? Because in order for something to merit as a mitzvah, the heart must be involved. And my heart was not involved in apologizing. So, does it count? No. So when you force your children to apologize to each other, they may apologize, they may say the words, but if their heart's not in it, it's not counting. Okay? So this is what I'm saying. Even if you force someone to say, and by force, what do you do? Even if you force someone to say that they are sorry or to be kind or what have you, if it's not coming from the heart, it's not genuine, it's not real. You cannot force someone to be kind. People have to choose to be kind. You cannot force someone to show grace. This is something that must come from the heart. So all of this to say that God did not have to demonstrate His grace to us and God did not have to demonstrate His kindness and His mercy to us. He did these things of His own free will by choice. He did this because He wanted to do it. Thus, 
the number for chen and chesed, the number for chai is eight. So look very closely at that number eight. If I take the eight and I lay it down on its side like this, Say it again. Infinity. infinity. It is the symbol of infinity. Why? Because the truth is that the grace and the mercy of God is limitless. Is without limit. Without limitations. He never runs out. So that God is willing to show His grace and His kindness to us at every moment. No matter where you or I are, no matter where we are in our walk with God. And oftentimes we stray, oftentimes we get off the path, oftentimes we get far off the path. When is God willing to demonstrate to you, kissing the kid? Grace and mercy. When he, is he willing to demonstrate these to you? The moment you turn. The moment you turn. When is God willing to forgive you? The moment you turn. So that Yohanan, John would say in John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sin, he is willing and faithful. To forgive us our sin. When we acknowledge the sin, we turn, we turn from it. That's all it takes to bring up these aspects of God. So, everybody have all of this? Tzitzit is to look upon them and to remember and do all that God has commanded. Um, Yeshua makes a comment about those among the Prushim who 
They made what, in the English, it says their phylacteries were very broad and their tassels were very long. And he criticizes them for it. This is what he's talking about. And so many in Christianity will say, because he never expected us to wear those, that that's what he was criticizing. No, he was criticizing the showiness of it. The reason why they would make their phylacteries broad, that is the, the, the uh, um, tefillin, which are, it's the box with the scripture that you put on your head and you put it on your arm. But you, and, and you take a, it, it has a, it has a leather strap and you wrap the strap around. And you actually make the sheet from Shaddai, right? By sufficiency El Shaddai, so you actually make a sheet on your hand with the strap. And you make a sheet on the back of your head with the strap. And we put, uh, we, we, we put the, on the door. Mesusa, thank you, my brain's clutching tonight. So you put the Mitsusa on the door. Guess what's on the Mitsusa? If you go, if you look at, the, at a Mitsusa, on it is the shade standing for Shaddai, which means my sufficiency. Okay, my God shall supply all your needs. Can we wear those? Can you wear what? No, the one that are The The Tefillin? In your home, yes. Here, no. Uh, we don't, we don't, uh, the truth is, is we do not wear tefillin on, on Shabbat anyway. Okay, so you'll never see me with my tefillin on Shabbat. The reason, you know why? Why do we not wear tefillin on Shabbat? Because the words in there, they're already in the word on Shabbat? No. It's because... So women can use it. Excuse me? Isn't that for men? Or, or, or yes, for there men? are debates in Judaism and sex of Judaism. There are certain sects that will tell you, yes, you can wear them or whatever. Oh. For the most part, Orthodox, we follow Orthodox Judaism. Okay. For the most part, they'll tell you, uh, you can wear it, but it doesn't do you any good. It's not doing anything. Okay? Because the symbol is for the, 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 the instruction is given to the man and the symbol is for the man. So the same is true with the, the tzitzit, the same is true with the tefillin, the same is true with the talit. Now the talit is not commanded at all. The talit is to have a four-cornered garment on which to attach the tzitzit. Okay? Uh, you will see many women here who wrap their head, who wrap their heads in shots in, uh, <coughs> because that is, that is the Orthodox Jewish style for a woman to come in with her head covered. Okay? Um, the issue is the mitzvah. This is always at the heart. Okay? Mitzvah is oftentimes translated as a good work, a good deed. The plural is meets vote, by the way. So, um, if I've got three sons, so if I tell one of my sons, you know, when they were growing up, and I would tell one of my sons, go get dressed. You and I are going out. So you go get dressed because we're going out. If one of my other sons goes and gets dressed, do I mind that he gets dressed? Okay, listen very carefully. I have three sons. I'm going to take one of them out. One. So I tell this one, go get dressed. We're going out. So he goes and he gets dressed. I'm pleased with him. I like the way he dressed. 
He looks very sharp, very nice. Little white shirt, little tie, the whole bit, little black pants, little black shoes. Okay, so he gets all dressed up. So, what if the second son also goes and gets all dressed up? He puts on his white shirt, his, his little tie, his black pants, his little shoes and socks, and he gets all dressed up. Good. Am I going to be upset with him for getting all dressed up? I may ask him, what are you doing? Right? I may ask him, what are you doing? Why? I did not tell him to get dressed up. I told this one to get dressed up, right? Am I going to be mad at this one because he got dressed up? I might even tell him, you look very nice too, you look very cute, you look very handsome and proper. But that doesn't mean I'm taking him out. So he got all dressed up for what? Nothing. <laughs> Hoping. There was no benefit for him getting dressed up, you see what I'm saying? <coughs> Because he wasn't told to get dressed up. He just did it. Because he saw the other one do it. <clears throat> one of the things that we have to understand in Judaism is this. <clears throat> there are those requirements that are specific to the men. And there are those requirements which are specific to the women. And then there are those requirements that are specific to both. They all have their place and they all have their purpose. The reason why God says this to the man is for a reason and for a purpose. The reason why God says this to the women is for a reason and for a purpose. The reason why God says it to both is for a reason and for a purpose. So, we just finished up teaching on the Ten Commandments on, sh on, the, on Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath, keeping Shabbat. Exodus 20 verse 8. Remember Shabbat to keep it holy. Right? Yes. Amen. You shall not do any work. Now here's a very important thing. It says, you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey. What do you hear left out here? Your wife. Why? Somebody's got to do the dishes. What? What? <laughs> no. The you there is plural. He's talking to both the husband and the wife. On it, you, to both of you, neither the husband or the wife shall do any work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, not even your ox or your donkey. For in six days God created the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day He rested. Therefore God sanctified the Sabbath day and made it holy. So there you have a rule that is applied to both the male and the female, both the mother and the father. Okay. Why does God command? I know we're not going to finish it tonight. Sorry. <laughs> Why does God command the man to wear tzitzit and to wear tefillin? Why does God command the man to do this? Good. Good. But wrong. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually not because he's the head. It's because the man is more apt to fall. To fall. To fall. When, whether you go to a synagogue or whether you go to a church, the congregation, the population of the congregation consists, the majority is what? Male or female? If you go to and walk into a church, any church or any synagogue, the majority of the congregation is going to be male or female. Why? Yes. Why? It's, a, it's true in the synagogues too. Why? More spiritual? Yes. That is very that is that is the truth. The woman has her heart more in tune to the spiritual nature. 
Do the rabbis speak to this? This is why the man is to take special care of his wife. This is why God does not give through Rav Shaul in Ephesians chapter 5, God does not give to the husband and the wife the same commandment. He gives them different commandments as to respect to their spouse. He tells the wife that she is to do something. He tells the husband he is to do something. What does he tell the wife? Not obey. Submit. Submit, but then he tells, he tells her why. There's a reason why. He tells her, respect your husband. He tells the husband, love your wife. Two different words, two different things. Why? Because we're, we come from different perspectives. What was that book, Venus and Mars? <laughs> so, but it is true. We're made differently and we come from different perspectives. Remember the tree of life? Remember the tree of life? And I told you that there were three pillars. One was judgment. This one is called direct access. But this one is called what? The pillar of mercy. Where did we see mercy? Kiss it. Remember that we said this represents, and this represents why, who usually is the tender-hearted one? Mother is usually more tender than father is. So when we were growing up, who would we rather go to to deal with us? Mother or father? I would much rather have mother deal with me than dad. Because dad's instant reaction, because dad was this, and dad's instant reaction was go for the switch, go for the belt. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to take care of this, and you're going to straighten up right now. Right? You're going to change directions right now. Where mom had more of the aspect of let's talk this through, let's get to the heart of the tree, let's get to the, what's going on behind the scenes, what all that kind of stuff. Mom was more gentle, more tender. Not that mom could not spank us. The problem with mom is when she spanked, she didn't know how to quit. She was like the Energizer Bunny when she got going. Okay? She would, she, she spanked hard and fast. Ba -ba 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 like that. And she was like a machine gun. She couldn't stop. Okay? Where dad, it was like you got three or four swats and then swats, you know, belts, and that was it. It was, but it was over. You know, you knew this was going to end pretty fast. He came down hard, but it was over. Where mom, she, you know, but but usually we would want to go here. Okay. This is why Rav Shaul says this that he talks about uh, the wife. The wife is to respect. Why? Because the truth is that's the major problem with the wife. She does not have the proper respect for her husband goes on to explain that Sarah, excuse me, Sarah called Abraham Adon. She did not call him by his first name. She called him Adon. What is Adon? Adon, how about if I go like this? So what is that, Adonai? So this is what she called him. This literally is my Lord. She called him this. She called him, today we would say she called him Sir. Okay. So what is the basic problem with the husband? That he does not show his wife proper love. What is love? Ahava. To give. Loving is giving. That he did not give to her sufficiently. Why? Because the man is usually thinking, come on ladies, you know where this goes. The man is usually thinking of himself. 
Men are selfish creatures for the most part. This is why Adam fell. This is why Adam fell. He fell. Why? Because Chava fell and he was selfish and he did not want to be separated from her. So he, he fell on purpose where she was deceived. He's, his sin is actually worse than her sin. So the reason why it is the man who is commanded to wear the tzitzit and the tefillin is because we're the ones who forgive. Where the woman is more controlled by the nefesh bechama, by the nefesh shmayi, by the by the heavenly instinct, the heavenly spirit, the man is more controlled by the earthly instinct. Okay. Why? Why is the woman more attached to above, where the man is more attached to below? But why? Because this goes all the way back to the beginning. From what is man taken? He's taken from the earth. From where is the woman taken? From him, from here, from beneath his heart, from under his arm. This is why she has a more caring, a more tender aspect toward life. Where he's from the earth, he's rugged, he's whatever, he's uh, uh, self-sufficient, he's uh, a preservationist, self-survival, self these kinds of things. This is why, by the way, ladies, when you're celebrating your birthday, and he brings you home a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and he tells you happy birthday. I'm going to be honest with you. He does not understand why you're upset. When he brings you home pans. Fried pans. Or whatever. Uh, Swiffer mops. When he brings you these things home as gifts. And he thinks you're going to be ecstatic with these things. He is mystified that you're not. He's even more mystified that you're upset with him. Do you know why? Because that's what he would want. He is actually sharing with you. Because what does a what most men what do they what do most men want? Tools. I love working, I work in construction, you know that? I love working with saws and hammers and tools. I have all kinds, I have table saws, I have all kinds of saws. And I love working with these things. When my wife, when my wife would bring me home a drill or a saw, and I would, great, man, this is cool, I couldn't wait to try it out. Why? Because I love the earth. But a woman, you're ecstatic about diamond rings, pendants, earrings, roses, candy, right? You see, this is the distinction. This is the difference. So, next time your next time your husband, your boyfriend, whatever, next time someone when when the guy brings you a tool. Understand, he's really sharing from his heart because he's giving to you what he would want if he were you. He just doesn't understand. Okay? He's being a good guy, so have mercy. And when it's his birthday, buy him a dozen roses, alright? Because that's what you would want. You with me? Everybody understand this? Okay. So this is why the man wears the tzitzi. Can a woman wear tzitzi? Yes. But the reason is because man's got a problem. The woman doesn't have the problem for the most part. It's the man who has the problem. The woman is almost always the more spiritual of the two. In the birth of Shmuel, in the birth of Samuel, 
Who is it that is heartbroken, so heartbroken that she goes into the temple and prays her heart out so that she can't even speak? She's weeping and crying so much. Who is it that does this? The mom. The mom. Hannah. Not the dad. It's the mom. This is why the man wears the tzitzit, because we get so involved in everything that's going on in the world and news and politics and all of these kinds of things and working and, and especially back in the day where the man was the one who was going out and doing the work and the wife was at home and raising the children and all of these kinds of things and the man, the, the mind of the man was on the world where the mind of the woman was on the raising of the children and she took on that spiritual nurturing nature. She did not have to be reminded. He has to be reminded. So how is a man reminded? When he first wakes up in the morning, the first thing he does is he puts his tefillin on to remind him the Word of God is to guide his thoughts, to remind him the Word of God is to guide his actions, his hands. We're going to get to that here. You. And then wears these all day long. Why? So that as he's walking down the street, he looks and he sees this. He sees that woman over there. He looks and he sees this. No, I cannot do that. He, uh, they give him too much change at the store. He looks down and he says, he says, see, see, that is not just. He has to give the money back. He can't just walk out of the store with it and say, finders keepers. He sees someone, someone broken down on the side of the road. He looks down and he sees this. He can't just drive by. He has to stop and help. That's why the man wears these. Can a woman wear them? Yes. But it's not for the it's not it's not for the appropriate reason. She's wearing it because she wants to wear it. He's wearing it because he's commanded to wear it. Okay? Everybody that got that? Alright. Back to the So where we were going with this, the talit, the wings, this is the vav, right here, this is the vav, this is the zayin, okay, remember if I put this right here, this is the zayin, this is the vav, this is the zayin, this is the wing, this part here, that's this part here, this is his wing. And what does it make? What does this do? It says chupa. By the way, chupa starts with what? Hey. Chupa. Not chupa. <laughs> chupa. And we told you what? That this is the... This is the... Act of the wedding ceremony. This is the coming together of the, of the bride and the groom. That the groom invites the bride to come under his wing, under his protection. By the way, why under his wing? In man, in man, what would be considered the man's wing? Right here. This is my wing. Where was woman originally taken from? Under him, under the wing. And so it's simply restoring the Garden of Eden. That the wife is being brought back under the wing of the man. Why? Because she went wandering off on her own. And she got deceived and she fell. So this is an act of tikkun kabbalah, this is an act of restoration. And it all symbolizes Mashiach and humanity and mankind. The bride is mankind, is humanity, and the groom is Mashiach. In the tree of life, The 
the tree of life. This is Malchut. This is called Malchut. Everyone say Malchut. Malchut means kingdom. The kingdom is the bride. This one is called Tiferet. Everyone say Tiferet. Tiferet. Yeah. Tiferet means beauty. This is the groom. Where do you find the bride? Under the groom. And what is taking place? They're trying to reconnect. Why? You can say that this is Adam. You can say that this is Chava. You can say that this is Mashiach. And you can say that this is humanity. If you want to know about Mahu, read the best story, read the Gospels, read particularly the book of Matthew, take note of every time he says the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like this. So it's the joining of two, together of these two. Under the week. Now remember that I told you. Uh, remember that I told you last week that that this represents that this represents the womb of a virgin woman. Thus the thus the the. Access the opening, if you would, is down to the ground. Meaning what? Meaning it's closed. It's closed off. So this would be like the womb, but it's closed. And I told you that Ted is the marriage bed. Where the womb is open and the woman can, and the, and the woman conceives. Do not misunderstand, because in Judaism, sexuality is not sexuality. Sexuality is a means of portraying spirituality. Thus, once again, you have Rav Shaul, you have Paul speaking to this in the Book of Ephesians, that the relationship between the husband and wife, where the two are joined together, become one. When did two, the two, when does the husband and wife join together to become one? In the sexual union. How do they become one? They produce a child. The child is, the, is part, is, has half of, half of the child's chromosomes are from the mother, half of the chromosomes are from the father. True or not? This is biology. Okay? So this is not this is this is sexuality to explain spirituality. It is not sexuality for sex for the sake of sex. And you have to understand this because people people say many perverted things, and we have to be careful with these things. I have heard so I have heard many unbelievable things coming out of the mouths of preachers and teachers who are supposed to be educated. And they take this and they misuse it and misapply it or whatever for their own gain, I would imagine, for their own purposes.
Remember what we said about this, that this represents potential. This represents actual. This, that this is a virgin bride, this is a virgin bride, meaning she has never been touched by a man. This explains to you this symbol. Why this? Because maybe not so much today with, um, and I, not, this is, this, you know, I, I ought not to generalize it too much, but I know that, I know more so back in the day, when I was a young, a young person growing up, and even before that, even more so, that a young lady was very careful to protect her virginity. A woman was very careful to protect her virginity. And so the fence represents a guard. protect because this is what the virgin should be doing do you remember that concerning the virgin bride the assembly in Christianity the church there are show that the Apostle Paul speaks to this that she the bride is to be ready to present herself to her husband to her groom how White, without spot or blemish. This is the, the, the picture that he's portraying for us, is that of a virgin bride who has protected herself, who has guarded herself, so that she is a virgin, she knows that she is a virgin. That is not an issue. By the way, in those days, in those days, who paid the price of the bride? So say it again. The dad. The dad. The father paid the price for the bride. He bought the bride. Now today, in today's society, because our minds are and we don't understand what's going on he was not buying her he was paying her price what was the price it was called a dowry what was the price what was the purpose of the price what was the purpose of this exchange of money because back then where where did you usually find the wife At home. Where? Doing what? But doing what? But what her basic, her main responsibility, the mother's main responsibility in the home, the children. Her responsibility was to raise the children. Okay? The man went out and he did the business for the most part. No, I'm not saying that women did not did not work. They did not earn money. These guys are saying. I'm saying that the ma major responsibility of of earning the finances for the family was through the man. The woman's responsibility was to raise the children. So, if the husband should fall off of his ox like some farmers today fall off of their John Deere tractor, run them into a ditch or something like that. If the husband should have his ox overturned on him and he is crushed to death, the woman is left a widow. What now? How does she live? This is why you read in Scripture so many times of widows being, being uh, destitute. Being in poverty. 
because they have no means to earn a living because their responsibility was in the home. When the husband died, particularly when he died early, she's raising children. How is she supposed to be raising children? They didn't do like we do today and send all the kids off to school for all of their lives, where the teacher is more of a parent than the parent is today. She was the teacher. She was the, she was the, she was the parent. She was everything. How is she supposed to raise, raise this child and these children and earn a living? This is what the dowry was about. If the woman for some, it's for some, in some way, some reason, lost her husband, her father had in store this money. This was set aside. This was her money. And it was set aside for her, for an emergency. That was the purpose of the dowry. So, the father pays the dowry. On the wedding night, they had means to inspect the bride, to check on her virginity. Now we look at this today and we say, you know, that's, that, that's sexist, that's horrible, that's all of this and all of that. Remember that the father is putting out a lot of money. Usually it ended up being like several years worth of wages. He's putting out a lot of money. She says that she's virtuous, that she's pure, that she's this, that she's that. Can women lie? Mm -hmm. By the way, in today's climate, in today's political climate and everything that's going on, this is why in Judaism you are not allowed to go on the say-so of a single person. This he said, she said business in Judaism does not work. This is why in Judaism there must be witnesses because anybody can accuse anybody of anything and make anybody look bad. So this business of all these accusations flying back and forth actually is not good. And especially when it's coming, and I'm sorry, I know, and I, you know, people are going to get upset with me because, but, but this thing of, of, of 10 years, 20 years later down the road or whatever, now you're making accusations and everything like that. Sorry. In Judaism, in Torah, in Torah, it does not work that way. You cannot do that. You can only, there must be, you can only judge someone on the testimony of at least two. And if possible, three witnesses. But they must be witnesses saying what? They saw. And that's not even that they heard. They had to have seen the act take place. By the way, so think of the woman, the, the prostitute who was brought to Yeshua by, by the leaders of the village or whatever. Because they said, what? We caught her in the very act. So, only under the, under the auspices of three, two to three witnesses who saw it happen. In Judaism, even if it's me, even if I, I cannot testify against myself, I cannot say, I cannot go and tell Gary, I did it, man. Really, I did And then Gary goes and tells the judge, he told me he did it. Sorry, it doesn't work. It cannot work. Huh? It's your say. Even if I told you personally that I did it. Even if I tell the judge I did it. I cannot be convicted without witnesses. Why? Because I can lie to The Torah is very firm on this. Can you imagine what it would do in our... Because you see, like I said, today anybody can accuse anybody of anything. By the way, this is why, i just tell you, I'll be upfront with you, I get very uncomfortable if there's just one woman here. And I'm here by myself. I hate being here alone and having a woman walk in or having a woman want to stay after and talk with me. Why? 
because my reputation is at stake. Mm -hmm. So I will not be seen alone with a woman. That's just the way it is. Because my reputation is at stake. So uh, just understand, I'm not trying to be rude. Uh, this is also true with texting and messages and all of these kinds of things. Oftentimes, when a woman texts me, I do not return the text. And if they text me too much, I'll tell them, you need to talk to my wife. If you want to communicate with me, communicate with my wife, and she'll communicate with me. And then I'll tell her what the answer is, and she can communicate back with you. Why? Because it just looks bad. You say, well, we're a modern society and all of these kinds of things. Well, maybe. But it is what it is. Okay? And it's not that my wife doesn't trust me. My wife trusts me to the hilt, and I trust her to the hilt. We have great respect and great trust for one another. It's not that. It's the appearance of everything. And how it appears not to us, but how it appears to one another. So oftentimes when, when the conversation is getting too involved or whatever, I don't mind the text here or a text there or something like that, don't misunderstand. But when the conversation is getting, you know, where I'm getting like five texts from somebody uh, in a row or whatever, I will hand my phone to my wife and I will say, on your phone, you answer these questions. Tell them, this is Wilma, I'm answering, Ed said to tell you this, 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 and this. And that's the way I work it out. Okay? That's just to protect myself. Mm -hmm. People get all, okay, well, it's, it's my reputation at stake. Okay? Somebody could accuse you of something. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Sounds good. So anyway, so that's what this is all about. Nice dialogue for fence, okay? Now, what, why is this important? We're going to close here. Why is this important? Why is this important? Because we are told by the scripture to put a guard upon my mouth. David asks God to put a guard upon his mouth, to put a fence on his mouth. Why? Because a lot of us talk too much. You see, it all has to do with this. You have potential. You have the ability to say something, but because you have the ability does not mean you have to say it. The thing about this potential is that it's not just one-sided. The thing about the potential is that it is a potential for good, it is also the potential for evil. You have both. Why? Because Adam and Chava tasted of the tree. What was the name of the tree? Good and evil. So you have the potential for both. So just because something pops into your mind doesn't mean that it has to come out your mouth. A lot of us, that's exactly what happens. We talk, we speak without thinking of how it's going to affect the person. And by the way, when we speak evil of people, when we speak evil of others, God has made it as... God has made it so that it actually boomerangs back and it hits us. Did you know that? When I speak evil of someone else, God has made it so that it boomerangs back to me. That it comes back to hit me. This is why we are told, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are holy, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are lovely, think on these things. So I might not like everything about you, but it is my responsibility to find the good in you and to appreciate, to like and appreciate that. 
You may not like everything about me, but it is your responsibility to find the good and the beautiful in me and act upon that. By the way, in Judaism, it is forbidden. It is forbidden to insult your brother or your sister. Huh? Who is my brother? Well, we can answer that question. You want to be here another 30 minutes? All right. So, so basically, we're not supposed to be insulting people. We're not supposed to be putting people down. In Judaism, it is required that you bless rather than curse. Not only does he require us to put a guard upon my mouth, but he also says that we are also commanded to put a guard upon our heart. You are to put a guard around your heart. What do you mean a guard around your heart? Be careful what you love. Be careful what you give yourself over to. Guard your heart. How do I do this? What is this guard? Because we are told, the first thing we are told to guard is Torah. First thing we are told to guard is Torah. You shall keep it. Huh? Mm -hmm. God has names as well. Yes. But all of these things fall under this realm. Everything we're commanded to guard, everything falls under this realm. She said to our mind that we're told to guard our mind. Yes. We're told to guard our eyes. Guard our ears. Mm -hmm. But it all comes down to this. If we're guarding this, then all of this is taken care of. The word for guard in Hebrew is usually translated in English as to keep. So if I'm living far off, this is the fence. This is the guard. The whole purpose of Torah is to show me how to do this. It's to keep me pure, unblemished, without spot, so that I might present myself as a pure virgin before the groom, before the Messiah. What is Torah all about? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Rav Shaul says, if you do that, if you are loving God with all of your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself, you are, in fact, fulfilling Torah. So, people who tell you, uh, we don't keep the Torah. Truth is, is Christians keep more of the Torah than they would like to ever admit that they keep Torah. Because they're doing these things, they are, in fact, keeping Torah. So the person who's up on the expressway, and they say, oh, I don't have to keep, I don't keep the speed limit. But they're only driving 55 miles an hour. Are they not in fact keeping the speed limit? Even if they deny it, they're doing it. So this is the potential. As I shared with you last week, the bride, Every woman has the potential for a child, even if their womb is closed, i.e. Sarah. Every woman has the potential for a child. What we're waiting on is the actuality of it. Every person has the potential to do good. But what is the actuality 
Because the truth is, every person also has the potential to do evil. And this is why this is Tet. This is Tet. The sound of Tet is T. T. There are two T's in Hebrew. The Tet. And the last one here is the top. This is the one you will see the most of. That's the one you see the most of. This one is less common. This is more common. Both of them T. The sound of T. The tet. This is the paleo of a tet. Guess what that is? Do you know what that is? Looks like a brand, right? An X in a circle. Isn't there like a shield or something? Like chicken in a biscuit? A snack, right? This is snake in a basket. The symbol is actually a snake in a basket. Do you know why there's a snake in the basket? In a basket. What do you think of a snake in a basket? Huh? Okay, a cobra, right? Yeah. What do you think about that? How would you like to have that basket? Is that a good thing? No. You see, there's a potential here. There's a potential within me. I'm the basket. There is a potential within me for good. But I must always remember that there is also the potential for evil. The serpent is there. The flesh is there. I have the potential to do both. So this is a warning to Even though I'm in a good realm here. Why? Because we have the Zion and the Va united together. This is in fact, in effect, the wedding. This is the wedding night of the Zion and the Va, of Mashef and the assembly. But even though I am united with the Messiah, I have the potential to do evil. I have potential to bring great harm. And I must be careful of that. So, this is why I need to put a guard. This is the reason why I need a fence. And this is why the rabbis a lot of people get upset in the Hebrew Roots movement, in the, in the uh, in Christianity. Well, that's just a man-made man tradition. The rabbis do what is called putting up fences. This is why putting up a fence is doing this. This is putting up a fence. How is this putting up a fence? Because the scripture says, You shall not take the name of Adonai Elochecha, the Lord your God, in me. So we put up a fence. Why? Because the further I am away from breaking the commandment, the more likely I will not break the commandment. This is why, rather than speaking out this, Holy name, we say Adonai, Lord, or we say Hashem, or any other manner of euphemisms. As we studied last night, I told you about it at the Tree of Life, the word Memra, which means the word, which John uses in John 1 1. In the beginning was Memra, was the word. That's a cover word for this. 
These are all fences. Why? Because he says you shall not take the name in vain. So the rabbis put up a fence to make sure that you do, you do not use it in vain. You only use it on Shabbat and holy days and only if there are at least a million, a ten men present. Otherwise, we do not use this word, this term. It's too holy. Even the scripture calls it the ineffable name of God. It means unspeakable. Okay, so that's a fence. You'll hear, see people on Facebook or whatever. Oh, that's just a human tradition. That's just the traditions of men or whatever. Remember this. How many of you go to the zoo? Been to Gladys Porter? It's a nice zoo, isn't it? Are you not glad when you get to the lion, the lion part that there's glass that's like this thick between you and that lion? I've seen kids go up there just like beat on the glass and oh, making all kinds of faces and everything like that. And as a parent, I'm glad, not saying that my kids did it, as a parent, I'm glad that that glass is this thick. What is that glass? It's a fence. Huh? You see those cute little monkeys that can bite the dickens out of you? You see that funny looking gorilla sitting over there on the island? There's a reason why he's on the island. Not just the fence, but what? Islands, water, and then a fence. There's a reason why. Because the more distance there is between you and that gorilla, the safer you are. The less likely there's going to be an interaction between you and the gorilla. The more space you put between you and sin, the less likely it is that there's going to be an interaction between you and that sin. That's what's working here. And we all say the Ivu. Amen. And so we say Shalom, Rafa, Shalom, Ben Laitov.